Hey, good afternoon uh, to wherever you are joining us from. Um, welcome to a very special uh, Naked Wine Tasting. It's going to be our virtual um, ninth birthday tasting. And um, I'm delighted to be sort of virtually here with an amazing cast of all-star winemakers. And we have some of the most successful, most popular, uh, and just uh, most amazing winemakers we've worked with the course of nine years of this business. Um, the plan for today is uh, going to be very informal. Uh, we're going to be hearing a little bit about some of the people behind the wines, um, some of their stories about what it's been like working with us at Naked as well. Uh, they're not uh, they're not scripted, and they're allowed to say whatever they want. So hopefully everyone will be you know somewhat kind, but I'm sure they'll be entertaining. <laughs> um, if you've got questions as we go through, um, please drop them in the chat. We'll try and answer as many as we can, and we'll do some some more Q and A towards the end. So ask anything; nothing's off limits. Um, you know, apart from maybe kind of politics. <laughs> so whatever you'd like to know, now's now's your perfect chance. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, uh, which will be many of you because I'm not a talented winemaker, so ultimately not very important. Uh, my name's Nick. I, I've been out in California since Jan 17. I had a chance to work with some of these uh, amazing guys and gals and uh, privileged to share some of those wines with you. Uh, and these, so these days responsible for running Naked Globally. And um, yeah, it's been an absolute honor of a lifetime, really, to be able to share wines from passionate, independent winemakers with I'm pleased to say a community of now 400,000 members here in the USA. So thank you all very much for being a part of that. And literally every single bottle of wine we make and every single winemaker we work with, we're only able to do that because of the support of our members. So I, on, from me and from, from everyone here, a massive thank you. Um, I'm looking at my notes I've been given here. The other thing I need to say is, you know, just remember, you know, this is a, you know, it's a social experience. Feel free to drink. Um, <laughs> ideally something from Naked, obviously. Um, I have got... A very nice bottle of Anna's here. It's a 2017. Um, I, I picked a wine that I can never say the ABA of, and I'm going to get this wrong, but Clove Dale Peak Pine Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon, I think. Um, the, the key news is it tastes really bloody good. Uh, right. <laughs> That's enough from me. Um, I want to kick it over. And the kind of first person I want to talk to, we, we were just doing a pre call and we worked out. You know, order of precedence that Macario, that you you were the first person to join up with this crazy gang. Um, so I want to start up by asking you about how you first got to hear about Naked and and your memories of uh, your very early days making wine with us. Yeah, definitely, Nick. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for joining the virtual birthday. Um, <clears throat> the nine of us uh, that make wine here would not be here without you guys and the support uh, that we've been able to receive over the years. Um, I was very fortunate to uh, basically start dreaming um, and able to take my sort of winemaking talents and expertise to another level uh, with your support uh, back in 2012. And for me, it was uh, starting off with literally, I think there was four Naked Wines USA sort of employees. Um, I happen to know Adam Ryder, who at the time was doing marketing. And Adam uh, said, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for some winemakers who want to do something different, uh, bring something new to the table. Uh, would you want to meet Rowan? And I said, sure, why not? I love talking about wine and I love making wine. So let's, let's do it. So I brought Rowan some of the wines that I had been working on and he really got excited behind him and said, I want, I want, I want to make this and I want you to make this on a much larger scale for us. Um, and I said, well, let's, let's make it happen. Um, and so I basically started out just, I had always had a vision or a dream of, of making uh, Spanish varietals here in, in the United States, uh, in, specifically in California. So much of California's lore and sort of history is, is Spanish based. Uh, yet the sort of varietals really didn't translate over. You always do see, uh, you know, the typical sort of, you know, Burgundy, Chardonnay, Pinot, Cab Merlot, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot. Um, obviously, Zinfandel uh, is a big one as well. And so I really wanted to try and find and uncover um, sort of little little varietals that were not as well known. So Tempranillo, Albarino, Grenache Blanc um, were some of the first ones that I really sort of focused on. In fact, so I'm much, drinking, much, for so me, much. I'm drinking uh, the Sin Fronteras uh, Dos Mujeres. Um, it's an Albarino Grenache Blanc. Um, we actually have a, a very nice warm day today in Napa, um, low, mid, mid 80s. So it's a perfect kind of white wine drinking day. Um, and I felt that it would make my stories a little bit better. So 
um, yeah, so it's been, it's just been great, great, great to sort of see the, the, the leaps and bounds of, that the winery has grown um, in the last, you know, nine years from a, a, a collective group of, you know, eight or nine winemakers meeting on a Friday afternoon for a barbecue to swap wines and talk about uh, their, their projects to now, you know, hundreds of winemakers across the United States and, and the world able to sort of share and kind of um, bring all those kind of wonderful ideas together and all sort of because of, of the angels. Um, Macari, do you remember the first wine you made? What was it? I do. Um, I made a Tempranillo from uh, the sort of Amador County, uh, Amador Foothills, uh, which is a region for those of you not familiar. Um, the Sierra Foothills are kind of below, and everybody seems to know Tahoe, um, the Sierra Mountain Range, and then right below it's the Foothills, and, and Amador is one of those uh, regions. Tempranillo was, was, a, was a great spot there for it. And then I also made a, uh, a pure Albarino that came from Lodi, um, and up until uh, probably about three or four years ago, I was still making that, uh, that, that Albarino, took a pause, I've started up with it again, but the Tempranillo I still continue to, to make, and I love kind of being able to, to sort of see its progression over the last nine years. So I think you know, going, going across then and to one of our other very early founding winemakers, um, Daryl, I, I'd, I'd love to you know, hear some of your memories of, of hanging out with the original Naked crew and um, you know, maybe some of the places that you've spent time uh, during, during your time with Naked. You've, you've, you've been with us from nearly the very beginning as well. Yeah, Nick. Uh, firstly, it's been a bloody fun ride, I can tell you that. And, uh, and, I, uh, and I should toast all of the Naked Angels out there that have stuck with us and, uh, and certainly helped us um, grow what we're all passionate about. But uh, yeah, I was, uh, I came on board with Naked in 2013. And I just jumped out of corporate life. And I was uh, in my corporate life, I, you know, was the executive vice president of winemaking and operations running 13 wineries, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't making wine. Um, so Naked was the perfect opportunity where I could get back to, uh, uh, to, to making wine and uh, you know yeah the the early days were in comparison to today today it was really simple back then um, you know we did all get together as a smaller group we got together often um, the simplicity back then was um, we actually told naked what we wanted to make this is what I want to do and we were able to do that. Where now it's a little bit of a combination. Daryl, you can you can make whatever you want, and we've got it. On, we've got it on video recording. So yeah. you know, just, just, just put your pet down. Well, we can, but but now it's a little bit. Well, here's what Naked Angels want also, and let's bring that together. Um, some of my early, uh, really fun memories were um, back in the early days of Naked. We would um, there would be archangels that would have little naked parties <laughs> with naked angels coming. There'd be uh, archangels that would uh, invite other um, uh, angels to their place and winemakers would come and uh, um, fly in if we were coming into the area. And I remember one of the early days going to uh, Michael and Carol's place in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and just having this hoot of a time with all of these uh, angels that were relatively new to Naked Wines and interacting and uh, playing cornhole and having some just great um, homely food. So that was really fun. And I also, um, you know, I make wine for Naked in Australia, uh, my home country. I make wine in California and my wines are sold in uh, those two places and in the UK. And another memory of mine early, um, we were just starting, I think Naked was just starting to sell, send California wine into the UK, Naked market. So um, I went over there to uh, Norwich, which is where the... Um, officers were to um, present and, and let the uh, Naked team know who I was. And they were surprised that I'd made the trip. And they said to me, did you just come all this way to Norwich um, because uh, you wanted to tell us about your wines? Are you that passionate? And I said, well, no, you know that castle down the road, Norwich Castle, uh, my great, great, great grandfather's death mask is there. 
and I've come to visit him too for the first time. As most people know, you know, Australians uh, come from convict ancestry and I was no different. So I uh, happened to uh, pay this visit there while I could uh, uh, present my wines and have a good glass of wine with all of the Naked team there. But it's been a, a fantastic ride and something that I just love, um, really love and cherish being part of. Bring us, bring us right up to the present day, Daryl. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've got in front of you. Because I know, you know, since you've moved out to California, you've fallen in love with the amazing pinots that can be made out in this part of the world. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's something that, again, I probably would have never made if it wasn't for Naked Angels and Naked Wines. Um, once upon a time, many years ago, I didn't actually like Pinot Noir. <laughs> that was probably about 18 years ago. And I partnered with a well-known chef called Charlie Palmer. And we run a uh, Pigs and Pinot Festival, it's called. Um, people can look at it online. We actually raise money for charity. And uh, we invite 60 Pinot Noir producers around the world. And a whole lot of celebrity chefs come in. And over these 15 years um, of inviting all these Pinot Noir makers who really want to go to this event. Um, I fell in love with Pinot Noir. And then I started to fall in love with different producers that made styles that I really liked. And uh, it was naked wines that came to me after I'd made a few, um, uh, I made a Vineyard Desinut Pinot Noir and a Russian River Pinot. And uh, it was naked idea that said, hey, Daryl, would you like to make a reserve wine? Because we have some really sophisticated drinkers now that are looking for really high quality wines. We know you can do it. So it really excited me. But then it was a little bit about, well, how am I going to go about this and get the best fruit? And uh, one of the wineries that I've been working with that I love is Arista, who are darlings of the Wine Spectator and have been making Russian River and Sonoma Coast Pinot. So um, I went to them and said, hey, you know, uh, would you, uh, can I partner and get some fruit from you? And uh, can I use your facility to make my first uh, reserve Pinot Noir? So this is my, I have my, I'm real excited about this because only two days ago it was released. It's my first uh, reserve Pinot Noir and it just comes from some fantastic vineyards in the, in the Russian river. And um, I got a case of it the other day and it's just about gone, <laughs> mainly because my kids are drinking it. <laughs> You can't, you can't get a better advert than that. Um, so I'm, I'm looking across and, you know, David, you're, you're, you're joining us here from the Bower Room, which looks like a beautiful, cool place to be on a, on a pretty warm day on the West Coast. Um, you know, tell, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, your, your introduction to, to Naked and, you know, how, 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 you, how you came to be part of this amazing family. Well, what, I have an interesting start because uh, I did send in some samples and um, was contacted uh, by the recruiting winemaker at that time. And um, he came to visit Washington um, right about uh, early spring. And if you guys know, I like to fish. And late spring is my favorite season. It's uh, spring salmon season, spring Chinook season up here. And I had a quandary. Um, he had a limited time here. And I had a boat that wasn't quite working the way I was liking it to. It, it had a problem. And so I invited that person out on a boat ride and that's how we got to know each other. And that's how I was introduced in, to Naked, floating down the Columbia River on my boat, trying to figure out what exactly what was wrong with it. Uh, luckily the uh, Naked representative was quite gregarious and really enjoyed it. And, you know, enjoyed the float back to the dock because I, I got the boat started at the ramp and ran up and we never did get it started back again. Um, it was the distributor cap that was the issue with it. I finally figured that it, out. So. Is it is it true, Dave, that you know a big part of the reason you kind of left your former employer was uh, you know ultimately a bust up over them not giving you kind of good time off during the kind of best fishing season of the year? That's part of it. I'll be honest with you. That's part of it. Uh, there's a there's a, a marketing event that strictly coincides with the first day of spring spring salmon season every year, and I asked to have that off and. They wouldn't give it to me so uh and it's, it's more fun you know it, actually i'm having way more fun doing this than um, i've ever had in my life making fun so well That's you it. know it's a, it's amazing the serendipity of kind of how life works out so kind of tell people a little bit about where you're sat and kind of you know the building you're in and what's around you and how how that all came to pass so um i found um 
a small town on the eastern edge of the Walla Walla Valley called Dayton, Washington. Um, they have a, believe it or not, they have a port facility here. Um, the Snake River runs through the county here and um, that port has a number of buildings both on and off the water. And I am renting three different units within that port and they've been very gregarious and let me um, do whatever I needed to, to uh, retrofit uh, cooling uh, drains, uh, connect, connect areas, so on and so forth. And so um, it's, it's just, you know, 15 minutes to our main vineyard in Walla Walla, Heritage. Um, it's a wonderful place to live. I um, enjoy, it's a very small town. Um, there was a cannery here for many, many decades and that cannery closed. So all of the sewage system, uh, the electrical, like right now, a lot of the state is, is experiencing rolling blackouts. And here we have so much overabundance of utilities um, due to the fact that one facility closing that, you know, we're, we're in a situation where uh, I, I can operate at whatever level I'd like to. And um, it's, it's really, really uh, a wonderful place. So I have this year. For those of you who might be who might be new to the wines of Walla Walla and Washington, you know, if you had kind of one thing that's kind of maturing in your barrels in in the winery, even out of startup here, that you're really excited about, tell us tell us what you're what you're looking forward to coming out from from you over the course of the next year. So it, it's always Syrah. I I love making Syrah. Syrah is my uh, absolute favorite wine to drink, absolute favorite wine to make. And um, I'm surrounded by it right here. We um, actually have a separate area just for Syrah here. You could call it Syrah. <laughs> no, no, no. We'd have to be we'd have to be criminals. <laughs> so, no, so I'm re I'm realizing the amazing the amazing number of uh, similarities we have in life. Because I and then I, I've got another David in another barrel room. Uh, he's also yeah. another amazing winemaker. So I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to move over to, to, to the one and only David Akiosi. And um, you know, how how many how many vintages have you you've been through with us now? You must be you know coming up on number ten. I wouldn't be a Zoom tasting unless we had a little moment of kind of you know working to have someone get off mute. But you know. The, David is a man of a few words, but when he speaks, there's always a lot of profound wisdom. So I, I'm looking forward to him finding the finding finding the unmute. How we do it? There we go. Well, you know that that would be a, a, certainly a, a a great feature between me and my wife. Sometimes you know, just unmute me. So um, yeah, here I am in the barrel warehouse again. Uh, this is where we raise our wines. Uh, it, you know, Naked Wines has been an amazing experience as a winemaker, simply because you know it. If you really think about it, it's a little bit arrogant for us to make a wine and then hope that everybody enjoys it when Naked Wine allows you to really have that connectivity with the actual people that, that taste your wines and help you understand your wines from a consumer point of view. So it's a little bit like this, uh, um, you know, that one movie, six degrees of separation. Now all of a sudden you have one degree of separation between you, the glass, and, and an angel. And that's, that's enjoyable. It really helped me understand wines in a very, very different way. So I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the secret yeah. behind some of your Chardonnays in particular. Um, I, I've got to say that, you know, I think, I think you probably make the, the, the best Chardonnay I've ever tried that you can buy with a $10 bill. Um, you know, what, what's the secret behind the magic? How do you make it happen? How does it taste so good? Secrets, no, there's no real secrets, Nick. You know, um, it, <laughs> still believe in the grapes, still believe in the, vine, in the vineyards themselves. You know, one of the, one of the uh, uh, wines that I make for the Naked Wines, it was the vineyard itself, Merrill Johnson was gonna go uh, um, under the bulldozer. It just wasn't making it. And yet recognize that it was such a unique vineyard. The Naked Wines uh, angels came in just in time really to allow us to not only keep that vineyard uh, growing as, as a, a particular Chardonnay vineyard, but still is to this day. So, you know, six years ago, it would have been flattened, probably re-developed. Re, uh, and, uh, you know, it's fortunate that we're able to find these gems for, for the Naked Wines Angels to, um, you know, like provide interesting wines to them. And, yeah, you know, I, I cut my teeth on these types of wines, right? And so working for the Mondavis, helping them develop uh, um, 
really one of the best selling Chardonnays in the marketplace uh, uh, through Woodbridge Wines. And also, um, you know, working with uh, the Mondavi winemakers, you know, you really helps you understand wines also and, and the craft of, of winemaking. So, um, you know, I, I really feel like I have uh, a pretty great background in Bordeaux reds and, and the Burgundies and Chardonnays and, and Pinot Noirs. You know, they allowed us to travel there to see um, where they're made, but also taste the wines and understand them at a, a much more granular level than again, just pour, opening a bottle of wine and assuming that you understand <laughs> what you're tasting. So, you know, that, that was amazing uh, part of my experience uh, as a winemaker. And uh, so taking us full circle, I, I know we've been, we've been putting out to a vote recently, uh, a Chardonnay yeah. project you've been pitching down in, in Monterey. Um, and I think the numbers are looking pretty good for you. Um, <laughs> if people are excited, they can let us know in the chat. But can you maybe tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what, what you're excited about by maybe going down to Monterey and making some wine on the Central Coast? Yeah, for, for a couple of reasons. You know, if you really think about it, there are um, not a lot of wineries represented in the Monterey region. There are, there are some that are very well recognized. And yet as a wine region, there aren't very many wines on the marketplace that represent Monterey County. Or, and it's such an amazing uh, area. Uh, the, the valley itself uh, has a real great diversity of, of uh, climactic regions. And you know, the further, you know, you're up north and it's cold and windy and the farther south you go, you start kind of closing in the canyon, you get a little bit warmer, a little less of the wind. Those all work into uh, a really unique viticultural area. So the people that I'm, I, I'm really interested in, in working with are still there. So, you know, 15 years after I left and started working at a different winery, they're still there honing their craft, making, uh, you know, wine growing grapes. And so it interests me to, you know, really kind of go for a full circle again, you know, really see those, the, those folks and, and connect once again with some really key Bit of culturalists uh, to make the wines because I know those vineyards and, and they were really the spice rack that helped produce our wines. And so I'd, I'd really like to go back there and, and uh, have a lash at it and, and uh, produce some fabulous wines for the Naked Wine Angels. I'm sure you're going to be able to, David, and I'm sure like everything you make, it'll taste amazing. I, I, I love that we're able to give people the platform to show off a lot of these kind of great sources of fruit that often get blended away and get hidden in, in, in big brands. So um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it and I'll certainly buy it. Um, so I, I'm going to get a pivot across. We're going to go all the way across the Atlantic. We're going to go and we're going to go and find Anna who, um, who is, uh, is kind of joining us late from Portugal. And um, so Anna, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of your wines and actually I've already got through the first glass of this, this cab that the 17 is going really nicely. If any of you have got any of Anna's wines in your racks, I find it a little like, a year or so of age and oh, they're just amazing. Um, but you know, t tell us a little bit about um, you know, what was the reaction when when you first encountered Naked? Because you, you again, you joined us back in the early days, 2012. Um, we were a pretty small company run by you know a, a charismatic South African guy in flip flops, right? I mean, it was uh, it wasn't exactly a conventional <laughs> wine industry move. So, t t what was it? What was it like when you when you first made that move? Uh, it was incredible. Um, first of all, I, I was familiar with um, Naked Wines um, since 2010. I was lucky enough to go to a Master of Wines seminar in Bordeaux and Rowan was one of the speakers there and talking about the Naked Wines concept. And I snatched the place next to him at a lunch and said, uh, when you come in California. <laughs> And I was a very young assistant winemaker at the time, but I had this ambition of making my own wines in my own terms one day. And he said, oh, California's too hard. And then two years later, I read um, an article online that uh, Naked Wines was coming. And right away, I knew that I wanted to join. And I had a lot of people saying, you know, it just sounds so too good to be true. Something has to be wrong with the model. It can't be right. Uh, and I said, no, it's real. This is for real. It's legit. <laughs> um, and explaining what it was. Um, and I just, I remember sitting in a little downtown house in Napa um, with um, people on flip flops and no shoes. And just, I love the casual vibe of it. And I really pitched that I wanted to make Portuguese varietals in California. And I, my first wine ended up being a Cabernet Sauvignon. 
that I still love, that I, it's one of my favorite vials to make. Um, it's my, it was my snow mechanic cab and I still make it. Um, but it, it was fun. And the funniest thing was some of the people that at the time were very cautious and warned me against it a few years later were asking me, okay, how could we get in? So I thought it was a really cool full circle story. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I, I guess tell us a, li a little bit more about, you know, the, you know, your style of winemaking but, and, you know, how do you think the different, you know, the different, you know, maybe the Portuguese heritage kind of plays out in the style of wine you're making for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I remember when I moved to California in 2000 and well, when I was an intern and I started in California in 2004, the first thing I remember, I loved the fruit, the nose of the California wines. I thought they were terrific, but then there was no acid to them. I mean, I think at that time, the style were these very IPH wines do. Uh, and I love acidity. I like, um, I like balance. I like a good structure, but I love a vibrant, nice acidity, in a, obviously in a white a lot, but I like that in a red too. I like a wine with some verve. Um, I like this, I like to call it a restrained opulence. Uh, I like wines that are, you know, they, they, they're almost too much, but then there's something that pulls them down, um, down a little. I love fruit um, and really softness in the mid palate. Um, and you know, dry wines, um, that's kind of the style that I always go for. And I really love mixing some of, you know, I, I studied in Portugal, that's where I went to university, but most of my winemaking training was in California. So um, I think I am a good, this kind of yin and yang of old world, new world um, that, I, that, I, that I try to show in the wines, I think. So, so maybe actually where, you know, the projects that we're about to start um, with you going back and making some wine in Portugal, in, in some ways it's, you know, going back to the, you know, the other way. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that and what angels should expect from some of the wines you're going to be producing uh, back home? Sure. So I, I finally, after a year and a half, I'm here. So <laughs> first of all, to see, to see my family, who I miss so dearly, my whole family, still, my parents, my brother, my family still here. But then next week is fully there. I'm on the beach right now, very fancy. Spend the day on the boat, on the beach. Uh, but next week, it's fully, I just had a fun conversation a, a little while ago uh, with the team, the wine, the, the, the seller, the winery I work here. Um, and five years ago, I had this kind of epiphany that I really wanted to go back to making wines in Portugal. Um, and so the rosé, the 2019 rosé was the first one that I made. Um, from the Lisbon region, so cooler region. Um, and, but my heart is in the Alentejo in the south of Portugal, closer to the Spanish border, warmer where the cork trees grow. And I will be making two different reds um, from 2020 um, that I'm really, really excited. They're Tempranillo Bays, there's some Turiga in them, some Tinta Amarela, some very um, traditional indigenous varietals. They're very bold. These wines from the Alentejo, they are there's texture to them. You can, I like to say they're wines you can chew. So um, trying to make that and then, you know, having that authenticity, but then still fit the angels' palettes and, the, you know, they are to sell in, in the U.S. market. It's been kind of a, of a chore. And then doing it at a distance because I usually travel to go three times a year since I've started this project. But with COVID, I was retained. So the logistics of samples and meetings and Zooms, it was, it was, it was challenging and fun in a way, but I'm so happy to be here and visiting vineyards next year, next week, and really dial everything in for, for, for harvest and some new projects that might come, including a white uh, from the Tejo region, from a cooler region near Lisbon too. And I'm really excited with all these new things, new things happening here, yeah. Uh, I for one can't wait, and you know I am you know, the only the only the only sad thing about some of your beautiful Iberian varietals you made for us in in California has been you know finding enough great vineyards planted. So uh, we're, <laughs> we're hopefully we'll finally be able to make enough of some of these wines to keep them in stock for more than about a month. But uh, yes. for anyone who's anyone who's watching, you should you should be following Anna and making sure you you get hold of these releases when they come out. Yeah, the um, trigger Tempranillo is amazed it's gone already. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if we if we head back over to to Napa and uh, gonna gonna let's move on to one of our newer winemakers and actually someone um, we're uh, we're getting close I think to the, the the much anticipated debut of your first wine for customers. Um, Dan, I'd love to um, you know introduce you to anyone who who doesn't know Daniel Barron, um, a legend of the industry. 
um, you know, made made Silver Oak for over a decade, and and actually one of the one of the nicest gentlemen you'll meet in the industry as well. Um, Dan, I'd love to get to hear a little bit about, um, you know, what it was that excited you after a long and incredibly successful career about coming and creating a brand with Naked. Well, I, I think David Akiyoshi said it really well. It, it's having a direct connection with with the with the consumer and you know we forget when we get into making large quantities of wine that you know I'm a musician and and uh, just like music is a communication with the listener um, the making wine is a is a direct communication with every person that has a glass in their hand and and it's just usually we have a few layers before we can we can really get feedback from the people who are enjoying the products of our labor. But with Naked, we, we have a direct connection and uh, we interact with the angels. And even, you know, at my, at my stage where I haven't released a wine yet, you know, and I show pictures of the vineyards that, that I'm visiting for 21, I get people say, oh yeah, I can see the difference. Uh, there's flowers now. Oh, look, there's fruit on the vines. It's, it's, so it's really fun, and that's um, that's an aspect uh, that I think too often we we lose touch with unless we get out in the marketplace. But that's that's you know self limiting. There's only if we're really making wine, we can't be out in the marketplace that much. Uh, so that that's really fun. And my first wine is as Nick referred to, uh, which I have right here is uh, the Francophone Cabernet Sauvignon with two threads that run through my winemaking life or having worked in Bordeaux, uh, being very influenced by, by my time in Bordeaux, working at a, a little property uh, called Chateau Petrus um, in Pomerol, and, and then starting the French uh, Christian Moex's project in California uh, in 1982. And then moving to the quintessential American Cabernet, uh, Silver Oak. So those are the th two threads that run through my winemaking life. I'm very conscious of the people that came before us that we're standing on the shoulders of, of you know, I think about my, my education at, at UC Davis, uh, learning from the great geneticist Harold Olmo, who had been hired by by Professor Bialetti, who had worked with Winkler, and you can trace it right back to the to the 1880s. So, um, you know, I like to pay homage to those those two different threads. Of course, the Bordeaux thread is is so interesting and and so deep. Uh, and so, I use part French oak and some American oak, and I think the the wine speaks to those sensibilities of uh, the great. Uh, wines of France and the great wines of California, but at a much more affordable price since we're going direct. And, uh, and it's, really, it's really been a fun, a fun ride. And then beginning in 2020, uh, I'm making uh, a Pinot Noir and, uh, from Russian River. And then in 21, I had the opportunity to get some amazing fruit in the Oakville uh, AVA. Uh, that actually Dr. Olmo first uh, took me to this vineyard in 1975. So to kind of circle back uh, on all of these threads has, has really been fun. Um, uh, I've had the privilege of, of trying the, you know, the initial release. It's not quite made it to customers yet, but I think it's drinking absolutely beautifully. Yeah. Um, we've, we've actually sold, I, I checked in, we sold over 30,000 bottles of it on pre-release. So <laughs> if, if, any, if anyone's listening... <laughs> Um, it, it, yeah, no, no pressure down there, <laughs> um, no, but um, uh, it's drinking beautifully and I, I think it's, it's got a real elegance and, uh, and uh, it's going to be really exciting to be able to share that wine with angels. Um, couldn't, couldn't be more excited about your homage project for, for the 21 vintage though. I think that's going to be incredible. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think uh, maybe we haven't talked enough about is the social consciousness uh, of Naked Wines and... Um, the fact, I think it was your inspiration, Nick, to work with the Roots Fund um, and bring some minority winemakers into uh, the California wine scene. So 
somehow I ended up becoming the mentor for uh, the first um, candidate from the Roots Fund, uh, an African-American woman from Baltimore named Kyle Burke, uh, who's going to be making her first wine or first Chardonnay in, in uh, 2021. So that's, that's really been fulfilling for me. I've heard amazing feedback um, and you've been out in the vineyards, um, you know, entertained her with great stories over dinner. So, you know, all we need to know now is wait eagerly for harvest. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got to, we got to, we've got to get through this season with, with no water. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a strange one so far, but uh, we just keep our fingers crossed. I look in, indeed and I, I think I couldn't couldn't wish more for everyone that we just have a nice simple growing season and um, you know we're able to make some incredible wine um, you know talking of someone who's you talk about the incredible weather that, that they're having and seeing recently um, Chris you, you've posted some amazing pictures over the course of the last 12 months from um, a really special piece of land uh, that's something new in your life do you want to just share with angels kind of you know where you're joining us from and um kind of maybe how your your life and, and winemaking life has changed since you started working with naked back in 2018 yeah uh, i'm actually in my empty cellar <laughs> hopefully it will be full uh, at least do the pinot blanc production uh, you see you've drunk 21. it all guys you've drunk it all that's what's happened <laughs> all right. well the case goods room is fairly full but the production side is a little empty <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, thanks to Angel support, uh, I went from running a huge custom crush facility making wine for a bunch of other people. Uh, you know, it's the biggest facility in Oregon and nobody even knows it exists. And I had my own brand for a lot, a lot of years and it was just tough to do everything. And, you know, Angel's support and just the naked wine setup where I don't have to do sales calls it's like the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> um, I think but yeah, kind of diving into a little bit, Chris, because for a lot of people, angels joining the call, you know, might kind of know, know how the industry works. And, you know, we, we tasted those wines. They were beautiful wines. Actually, we sold a few of them to members. So, you know, you've been making great wine for a long time, but, you know, explain a little bit more of what, what some of the hidden elements are if you're trying to go it on your own and build out a brand and, you know, what actually, you know, life can, can feel like day to day. Yeah, I mean, everybody has this admiration for the wine industry and, and wants, well, not everybody, but a lot of people want to be in the wine industry and have their own brand. And But you're the jack of all trades. You're the guy in the vineyard. You're, you're the guy in the winery. You're the one doing all the taxes. You're the one filing all the federal paperwork. You're doing all the sales calls. You're doing wine deliveries. You have to be good at everything and find time to do everything so um yeah again the the naked wines uh mantra is true it it relieves us of a lot of the the burdens that we don't enjoy doing and uh you know we get to focus on the winemaking and on the vineyard side of things and uh frees up some time to enjoy life as well yeah, well, you know, and you've got a young family, so that's super important. But to, to tell us a little bit more about the vineyard side of things, because, um, you know, one of the big developments for you, I know, is being able to kind of put down some roots and, and purchase some land. So tell us about what you've got growing and, and your plans for it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, about a year ago, I guess, yeah, pretty much kind of parted ways with my old job and just fo wanted to focus on the Naked project and focus on the family. And then come harvest, I found find out one of my Pinot Blanc vineyards is for sale. And so it kind of happened quick, but now we have 18 acres of vines and uh, it's a lot of work, but you know, it's work for us instead of uh, somebody else. So it's been, uh, it's really fulfilling, uh, you know, being on the tractor every day. Uh, yeah, I've posted some pictures of me and my little boy riding around on the tractor and uh but yeah we have pinot blanc which was the main interest there's pinot noir um some interesting varietals we have gruner um a uh, little bit of chardonnay some riesling um, pinot gris as well which obviously goes into my big pinot gris project but um 
Yeah, it's and it's riverfront. So Dave, I get to go fishing whenever I want. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is about winemakers and naked wines and fishing. Um, but you know, I, I, I swear, you know, every every single time you try and contact someone, you get them out of office. And you know, whether it's you know Scott Kelly's got the fly fish on his label, uh, you know. Penelope is making sparkling wine for us the other day with, you know, oh, I'm off on a week's fishing holiday. It's, uh, right. it's clearly the, the, the hobby of choice in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice just to be out and enjoy the river and, uh, it's relaxing, you know? Well, well, let's, let's cut across to someone else who I know has got a kind of passion for the land. Actually, you know, a few of the same varietals that, you know, planted, but, um, I, I want to, come across to another new winemaker that uh, we haven't had a chance to share any wines from yet although it feels like we've been working with Unova for a while now and actually we've got we've got children in the same daycare in Napa it's it really is a small industry um, but can you um, can you tell us a little bit more about you know not so much kind of the things you've been doing recently but your your kind of the, what you're what you're looking to achieve in the next phase of your career and your in, and and the, the projects you're looking to get started on the east coast yeah, so um, it, it's been a, a quite a ride so far, and you know, I I am based in Napa, but um, I have a real passion for other than California wine regions in the U.S. Because you know, you look at the continental U.S. and we're as large as continental Europe, and it can't just be a few states that have great possibilities. And so um, I was educated at Cornell University, and I did my first harvest in Pennsylvania, and then the next three in New York. And so I was a very non-traditional American winemaker, I guess you would say from that perspective. Um, but that being said, you know, I've worked in almost every region of California now, and uh, I've also worked up in Washington a bit. And I really love the Finger Lakes. It's my, I just absolutely love it. I don't think enough people know about it. And uh, I'm so excited to be the first New York winemaker on the Naked Wine uh, website and you know it's it's a it's a big responsibility I take very seriously to kind of open an entire state to such a a huge group of of wine enjoy, enjoyers I, I understand that like I am the one that will introduce this, these states wines to this group and if I do it well then other people will be able to follow in my footsteps. And, and so that means a lot to me. And so I've gotten a lot of support from the New York wine industry. They're so excited about this project. Um, we are still a small industry compared to California. So um, for the Snowshell Vineyards uh, inaugural release, which was the 2020 vintage, um, we crushed it no less than four different wineries because there's not a single custom crush place in New York that can handle not only the high quality that we need, but also the large volume, <laughs> which is by California standards is nothing, you know, so, um, so my goal is to open a very boutique luxury custom crush spot so I can not only do the snow shell vineyards wines, but also help other wineries expand and grow their brands in the region when they might not all otherwise be able to. So um, it's a really exciting thing. Loving the the love for the Finger Lakes. Yay, Kika Lake. Um, our our Snowshell Vineyards Riesling is sourced both from Cayuga and Seneca. So for those of you familiar with the area, um, we've got several vineyards on both lakes. Haven't got anything from Cayuga yet, but I wouldn't rule it out. That's got some great spots over there. Um, and it's just a so picturesque region. Like I've traveled all over the world uh, to different wine regions, and I still think that the Finger Lakes is the most beautiful in the whole world. I know that might be, you know, sacrilegious to say in front of all these. Uh, that's, it's but, such yeah, a I big really... call, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a high, the, the great thing about the wine industry is it doesn't take you to too many ugly places, right? But it, it is a special part of the world. And look, this is angel power in action. You know, I think it was, I remember, you know, being involved back in 2018, we asked customers where they really most wanted to see a new winemaker from, and New York was, was you know the number one pick. So it, it uh, the downside of the downside about wanting to make great wine and do it right is you know it takes a while. You have to find someone amazing like Nova, and you know you know we we, we need you know we need to turn the the fruit into wine. But uh, it's so close. I'm very excited. Uh, tell us, th yeah, there's clearly so a lot the, of people on here who. who, who <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there's a lot of people clearly on here who kind of are familiar with the Finger Lakes and very excited about the project. But for someone who isn't, tell us a little bit about the style of Riesling that you should expect coming out of your, your wines. 
Sure. So um, for those of you who like old world Rieslings, it, I always liken it to kind of a little bit of a mix of between Alsace and then Falk in the um, in the German wine area. So it's not the, the wines that I'm making are from more the, the middle to the northern ends of the lake. And so they tend to be a little bit broader on the palate. The ones on the southern end of the lake are more like Mosul. They're very steep slopes and a lot of slate. And, and so they tend to be more linear on the palate. So the, these wines, I think, will match what the angels are looking for really, really well. And I really looked for those vineyards that would deliver that style. Um, and so it's going to be this beautiful aromatic wines with this, this gorgeous mouthfeel. Um, so that's really what we focus on. And, uh, you know, the soil in the area is very diverse because it's all um, mixed up by the Wisconsin Glacier. So 11,000 years ago, the Wisconsin Glacier receded and just dropped kind of everything in the middle of the, the, the region. And so you can go like 10 feet and have a completely different soil type. But it's, it's really cool because that gives you a lot of diversity within the vineyards and a lot of different profiles. Um, and so it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's a challenging region though, because as you know, our weather is um, not as predictable as some of the other places in the US. Uh, we don't have uh, some of the problems that California has. We have plenty of water, um, but we also have plenty of water. <laughs> so today it's, you know, thunderstorms and, and rain in Geneva, New York, and it's not uncommon for that to happen throughout the growing season. Um, so our, our weather can be quite variable. We get hurricanes and, and things like that. So, it, you know, it, it, it comes with a lot of challenges. It's kind of like altitude training for winemaking a little bit, but, um, you know, it, it's fun because of the challenges. So it's, it's always exciting to, uh, to be part of that. I'm tremendously excited. I still vividly remember the first samples we had from you and, and tasting them in our tasting room downstairs. And we knew we were onto a winner. I can't wait to share the wines with angels. Um, Me too. I'm, I'm excited about it. So, so, so last but by no means least, um, Rob, uh, you know, talking about the kind of challenges of, you know, ma making, making wine in a warm climate. I, I remember <laughs> you posting last year about the temperature as you were, you know, pressing off the juice for your cool climate, uh, sparkling <laughs> wine from the Russian River. Um, but do you, do you want to you tell us a little bit about, um, you've obviously got a few wines out on the side, including one in a very big celebratory bottle at the moment. Yeah. Sure, um, sure. But but I, 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 what are you drinking today? What have, what have you got in your glass? I've got the, the McNeil Rosé, the, the recent release, and it's got a really nice dollop of some Santa Lucia Highlands Pinot Noir that anchors the color and the kind of the cherry raspberry flavors. So that's what I'm ha I'm happy that I'm on East Coast time as I sit here in Healdsburg. So cheers to everybody and the, the ninth, ninth birthday that we're celebrating. So thank you for having me on. And um, yeah, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a newbie. Uh, 19 Vintage is the, my first with Naked Wines on two fronts. We've got the Charmant uh, products that we've been drinking for about a year. The first uh, production was last February of 2020. And um, but I've been an angel actually for about five years because I've always enjoyed the quality value of all the wines and and drinking wines from uh, you know a lot of the winemakers who are colleagues and buddies that I've known for a number of years, like Mr. Groom over here, you know, I've known him for a long time, and um, and so with naked wines for me, uh, yeah, like Daryl too. I had a period of my career where I had big responsibilities with big wines companies, and you know, a fair amount of management responsibilities, and. What I've really enjoyed over the last couple of years with the Charmant and the Method Traditionnel um, programs is that I've been able to get my fingers sticky again and, and, and dive into the winemaking from the grape to the bottle. And it's been very rewarding. And I've never had a label with a McNeil on it. I've never thought of McNeil as a, as a wine label, actually. You know, it's more like a, like a scotch or something named, but, but um, it works. And um, I'm just grateful that uh, the majority of the angels have appreciated this product. Now, um, so we've had the, the 750 versions of a McNeil Brut and a McNeil Rosé, Method Charmant. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we released Magnums of the McNeil Brut. And that was a big project. And, uh, you know, not, it's, it's not easy to find somebody set up to produce Magnums with this method. And we had to get some uh, special glass uh, 
from France, made from Sa by Sabre, a wonderful glass company that actually started in the late 1800s, about the same time that Method Charmant was being invented in Italy and perfected in early France by Monsieur Charmant. And um, so we have special lot of glass come over. And then the, the winery in Napa where we made the Magnums had a lot of small 500 gallon tanks. So there are a number of fermentations that we did uh, to produce the Magnums for everybody. And um, I think it turned out pretty well. And I hope you know, everybody who pops one uh, will concur. And, you know, I just, you know, for you, all of you angels out there, you know, you've got a Magnum, uh, so it's a, it's a bottle that you can share with somebody, uh, but in case you don't and you don't finish your Magnum, um, I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but you've got these little contraptions that you can get at a store, and these are champagne stoppers, and you can, uh, they'll hold the gas overnight you can get another one or two openings of the bottle and the carbonation will still be there. So I recommend uh, you should always, even regardless whether you have a Magnum or not, you should have uh, these little things. It costs five, $10 a piece in your, in your arsenal, your wine uh, arsenal. So, so, so pro, pro tip there, Rob, the, tell, us, tell us very quickly a sure. little bit about the Russian River project that's coming up. So, okay. you know, you, you've, you've, you've got some, pretty big names on your resume that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily call out for, you know, whatever, whatever reasons, but you've made some, some very well-known sparkling wines and no, I've been, giving I've you a chance to, sure, sure, sure. I've been giving you a chance to go back to that. So tell us a little bit about that project and um, what angels can expect when that releases eventually. Okay. Okay. So the first vintage was 19 and um, I'm about to start working on the finishing uh, winemaking artistic step, which is the addition of a sugar wine liqueur and figuring out what that concoction is going to be made from. And it's a really interesting step for making sparkling wine in that um, it's the primary reason for this uh, liqueur uh, is, you know, which is a you know, wine sugar mixture, is to balance out the acidity. But you can, you can use different wines to mix with the sugar and there are other little things that you can do to add complexity and drive the style of your, of your wine. And so the 19 vintage, which was set up with the secondary fermentation in the bottles in the beginning of 20, um, is, is, has now been aging for 18, 19 uh, months. So I'll start working on the dosage to finish the wine at the end of this year to be released early next year. So, so basically the wine will have taken about 20, almost 30 months to, to make. And that's the method traditional uh, series. And, you know, we made another uh, set of uh, Brut and Rosé in 20, and also a nice little Blanc de Blanc that has been uh, fermented and aged in, in a variety of French oak barrels of different ages, which is going to be a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, cool climate, warm climate. Uh, last year, you know, I've been at this winemaking since the early 80s. And last year's vintage, the beginning, I've never seen anything like it. It was really challenging. And um, so someday when that 20 Brut and Rosé comes out, appreciate it, that fact that it was made under 105 and 104 and rain and lightning and smoke and an evacuation. <laughs> we had that all in one week. And uh, it's a challenge, but uh, we got we got through it. We worked hard, and uh, it's gonna be it's gonna turn out okay. I, I can't. I for one, I can't wait to crack it open and try it. It's it's the hard part of this job. You have to kind of restrain yourself because you you know you sign these contracts and you get all these amazing people making these wines, and you have to wait for years for them to come out. But it's gonna be good. No, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so we're coming towards the end of our hour, and you know time has flown by. But we've got we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone's got any extras pop them in the chat. Um, I, I don't know how, if we'll draw him out on this, but Todd, you, you, you wanted me to ask David Akiyoshi. Um, Todd says, you know, we're not wine snobs, um, but the wines you make now are so much better than the wines your previous employer made. Um, you know, what's the secret? Uh, care to comment how or why? Um, what is it, David? Is it just the wisdom of age? Is it the support of angels? You know, what, 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 why do the wines you're making out of Lodi taste just so good these days? Well, I think it's like anything else is, is uh, um, you know, got to hear the music and, and 
feel the rhythm before I really start, you know, dancing correctly. And, and so uh, it, it is, as I said before, that, that frankly, um, you know, to make wines that uh, appeal to the angels is, is really core to this, to the winemaking here. And, and uh, you know, certainly uh, trying to create wines that, that are very expressive of the varieties and really trying to find those, those gems that really work with, with the angels. Yeah, I think it's like most other brands, it's, it's about building the, 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 the um, repertoire, finding the vineyards and, and really working with those wines to, to create uh, wines that, that are you know, fitting for the portfolio. Well, I, I think you do, you do an amazing job. Um, and uh, you know, we, we, we want to keep at it for many more years. Amen, brother. Um, do you have um, one question here, which is um, for, for me, actually. I don't know. So Glenn's asking whether or not we might create another tasting room. And for, for those of you with long memories, we've had tasting rooms back in, you know, downtown Napa and out in, in Kenwood. A absolutely. It is something we are kind of thinking about and looking at, um, you know, whether that might be associated to one of the wineries we're making wine at um, or whether we might do something in a, in a, in a downtown location. It would certainly be really fun to, to share wines, you know, in person with more of you. Um, we pour at a bunch of events in, in Napa as well. So my one plug will be, if anyone's an avid runner, um, you can come to the Napa Marathon every year. We're always sponsoring that and they're pouring wines. Um, but look, look, watch this space. And I hope in the next year or two, we'll be able to find a new permanent home uh, where, we can, where we can meet some of you in person. Um, so I'm just I'm just looking at the chat here and seeing if we've got any more kind of final questions. If anyone's got anything else they'd they'd like to ask, then now's now's your chance. I'm going to find um, one more from 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 our from our chat here. Um, and this one, you know, anyone could anyone could answer this, but you know, maybe maybe Daryl, you might be a good person to kind of answer this. Um, Dwayne says, I'm I'm both a wine lover and a business person. And I'd like to understand a little bit more, um, you know, what some of the differences are kind of commercially for a winemaker working with naked wines. Uh, not asking for actual numbers, but I'd just be interested in understanding some of the different trade-offs and kind of, you know, what's, what's it like working with naked? Um, so, you know, Daryl, you've, you've seen everything under the sun in your time making wine, uh, you know, in the northern and southern hemispheres. Can you paint a picture for Dwayne? You, you know, it's a great question. And there's so much that is really special about naked wines and different to making wine commercially. But I think the one that stands out for all of us winemakers is exactly this, what we're doing now. In my commercial way, we would, I would never be on a chat with so many people that are buying my wines. And one of the things that um, I think we all really love is the feedback that we get. I look forward to it weekly to look at, to do all my angel replies, to get feedback on my wines in a commercial sense. Um, Anybody that tried my wine, I'd never hear from them. But now um, all of the angels that uh, let you know what they don't like about your wine helps us enhance the quality of what we do. We think about it more. But there's something really special hearing from so many people that, uh, that try your wines, that really love them, that you're knowing that directly that you're enhancing their life or their afternoon or their, or their gathering. Um, but I think overall what makes it, easy, and if I'm answering the question correctly, the, the biggest difference is, as we all know, is trying to sell our own wines through a commercial situation and knowing what the consumer wants is really tough, but uh, naked wines make that a hell of a lot easier. And I've got one, we've got time for one final question, and Daryl, as you're on, you're a good person to answer this as well. Um, Robert wants to understand the secret of how does a wine that's not made in America kind of make it ultimately into a bottle and onto you as a Naked Wines customer. So maybe explain, tell us how you say, for example, your Adelaide Hills Sauv Blanc um, makes its way to an angel's door in America. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I make wine in Australia and I make three wines, a Sauvignon Blanc a, uh, and two red wines. Um, so in the early days, we would make this i would go to australia i would make the wine for the vintage and i would bottle the sauvignon blanc all in australia and um and i would then send over the portion to that was going to be sold in the us as bottled products um as um as that program has grown and also some of the archaic 
laws we still have in the United States that being an Australian, I still scratch my head that in Australia, if anyone wants a bottle of wine, you can just get them a bottle of wine. Um, so now one of the things that we do with my Sauvignon Blanc is we bring it over in a large flexi tank and it's like a big bag in the box and uh, the quality control is all sort of superior and we bring it over and we actually bottle the wine now in the United States and that way we can open up um, that wine to more customers because of some of the legal laws. Um, because my red volumes are a little bit smaller, we, I still bottle them in Australia and we bring them over here. But uh, I love doing uh, the vintage in two countries and being able to have contrasting wines that as a winemaker that I can offer to, to so many angels. That's really special to be able to do that. All right. Thank you very much, Dal, for, for answering that one. And uh, finally, two, two thank yous. Firstly, to you know, all of my star guests for joining us here and taking up your time. You know, whether you've joined us from you know, fresh, off, fresh off the beach in the late night supper in Portugal or, or whether you're sweating it out up in the Pacific Northwest, um, thank you all very much. Um, cheers. I, I've got an empty glass again, Anna, so that's, that's going down very nicely. Um, and then the biggest thank you of all, thank you to all our angels uh, for joining us today, for your engagement, your comments, but more importantly, for helping us support amazing winemakers like these guys. Um, we very literally couldn't do it without you. And um, so cheers, uh, wherever you are. I hope you enjoy the glass thing nice tonight and take care. Uh, cheers. Thank you, angels. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.